This video is a little documentary about a project that I put together here in the end of 2019. It's really a kit that I bought from another person. Uh, it's not offered as a complete kit, but rather just as a uh, circuit board with a couple of pre-programmed chips. Uh, it's a single board relay computer, and to set the stage for this, I thought I would give a little bit of history. So what's a relay computer? Well, a relay computer is a computer or a computer system built primarily using electromechanical relays and relay logic. These were popular for a short period of time, probably between the late 1930s and into the 1950s. And according to some computer historians, they constitute the first digital computers. Of course, by the time World War II rolled around, there were already computers being built and designed that used electronics for the processing instead of electromechanical means. And most of these, of course, because it was before the advent of semiconductors, these were based on vacuum tubes. By the 1950s, most commercial computers were based on transistorized circuits rather than vacuum tubes. And, of course, uh, the relay computer was still being made in certain areas for certain applications all the way up into the 1950s. Following the vacuum tube computers, transistorized logic circuit computers came along, and by the uh, early 70s, microprocessors were coming out that were suitable for use in uh, design of computers. And this leads us to the need for single board computers. Single board computers were something that was needed by engineers and hobbyists alike who were first being exposed to the new microprocessors. It was a way to fairly inexpensively experiment with the new microprocessors to see how they could be used, what they could do, how to program them, and get a real feel for them. And pretty much every microprocessor that came along had a single board computer designed to go with it as a demonstrator, a trainer, an evaluator, etc. One of the most popular and famous of these was the Kim 1 pictured here. This was designed by Chuck Peddle, uh, who was the original was on the team that developed the 6800 microprocessor then he went to MOS technology and was the lead engineer on the de development of the 6502 microprocessor which of course was famous for use in the Apple computers and the Commodore computers and he also designed the Kim 1 as an evaluator for the 6502 the Kim 1 was typical of other single board computers that came along and pretty much all of these had the same features. These common features of single board computers included the processor itself which was usually a microprocessor, a small amount of memory for the program, a small keypad for entering a program into memory, a small seven segment LED display for viewing program addresses, opcodes, and other data, a simple monitor program to facilitate program entry and verification and to view various registers during program execution, and some basic I.O. so the computer could interface with other equipment and or other computers. There was usually also some means to store and reload programs to external devices. So back to the subject of this video, the single board relay computer. Just like the aforementioned single board computers, this one has a monitor program, it has a small amount of memory for program storage, it has a keypad for entering a program and controlling the computer, it has a seven segment LED display to display addresses, data, and other information, it has uh, some status LEDs in addition due to the nature of the relay computer, it has some I.O. to interface with real-world devices, and uh, the monitor program allows it to communicate over a serial port with another computer. 
and this is how uh, programs can be saved for future use. Really the only significant difference between this single board computer and others is that instead of a microprocessor to do the execution of the code and do any logic, etc., it uses a electromechanical relay computer. Uh, harking back to those old uh, relay computers from the 30s and 40s and 50s. While there are other relay computers that are contemporary these days, uh, made by various hobbyists and so on, most of them are quite large and uh, many of them require fairly elaborate computer setups and are not especially user-friendly. The designer of this kit, and I really think it started out as just a project that he did for himself, that would be my guess, but I don't know that for certain, uh, is well packaged and presented on a single board like the old single board computers which made it appeal to me more than some of the other designs. I like the fact that it had a nice balance of you know the vintage relay circuit but also it has some microcontroller functionality up front to make the user experience a little nicer so you don't have to deal with such clunky uh, programming methods as some of the other relay computers might have, and you don't require a personal computer or other equipment to program and operate this relay computer. It's all on the one board. Once I decided to build one of these relay computers and I found out that they were available, um, I investigated and found out they were only available as a partial kit, meaning just a printed circuit board and a pair of pre-programmed microcontrollers which basically handle the upfront stuff and the monitor program. Uh, everything else is just on a bill of material which can be downloaded and then you are responsible for buying all the parts yourself. There is a downloadable assembly document telling you how to put it together it's really written for experienced electronics kit builders and not for beginners. Uh, I have conformed the original bill of material to an all digikey bill of material that's downloadable at the links presented at the beginning of this video. And also I referenced uh, the eBay store of the uh, kit developer where he sells the, the partial kit and also I made reference to uh, some of the other documentation uh, locations where you can download the assembly instructions and other uh, reference documents. So with all of that uh, aside, I'm going to get into the assembly stage of this kit now. As received, here's the printed circuit board front view and the back view. I start out by soldering in most of the resistors and there's some more and then various diodes and transient suppressors and then all of the IC sockets and then all of the relay sockets which are a different type then the discrete LEDs and the discrete transistors I decided that I wanted the seven segment LEDs to be on sockets so I cut apart some 18 pin dip sockets and there are the uh, seven segment LEDs plugged in and the electrolytic capacitors and ceramic capacitors. The push button switch array and the input and output terminal blocks on the top of the board. The relay board requires a 12 volt regulated DC power supply, good for at least 2 amps. I got a 2.5 amp supply. The relay logic uses the 12 volts and then there's a 5 volt switching regulator on the circuit board which produces 5 volts for the uh, solid state logic circuits and here I'm testing that to make sure that it's functioning. It's the only IC that's installed at this point. All of the other ICs are installed here, and here is the first power-up with the power switch off, 
and then the power switch on, you can see that some activity is on the board now. Here I'm going through a prescribed series of tests of the monitor program, the keypad, the display, and the microcontroller functionality. Here the system clock is being set to 5 Hz. All of the status LEDs default to certain status as shown in these uh, couple of pictures. The original bill material called for switches by the same manufacturer but with a round uh, cap and a bit smaller but I found that there were many different keycap styles available so I ordered the largest square ones that were uh, readily available from DigiKey and uh, that was so that I could put labels on them later and have enough space to do so. The circuit board has all of the push button functions as silk screens but I've always found those to be a bit difficult to use since it's hard to see from the position that the user is usually seated relative to the computer so I resolved to uh, make my keypad or keycap labels at this stage. I used Front Panel Express's Panel Designer free software to lay out the um, graphics for all the keycaps. Here I've got borders laid out which I'm going to cut away and those are some center lines which I thought I might use. I filled them all with a large font that would fit and then change them to the appropriate uh, hexadecimal numbering system and printed out a test copy on my laser printer. I cut a few of the samples out and put them on the keycaps to test for appearance and size. Then I went back into the software and made some adjustments especially to the function keys at the right. I uh, altered the font and the font size a bit and changed them to yellow so they would uh, jump out as being distinct from the hexadecimal part of the keypad. With the keycap graphic artwork design and sizing now proven, I printed it out for real on the now sadly discontinued 3M print to last paper which was developed for the military. It's a laser printable, I think it's a porous plastic, extremely durable, and once the laser is printed onto it, I think the toner goes down to the, the, the semi-porous surface so it, it doesn't come off very easily. It's really on there good. I find that's very useful for things like this, but I have to conserve my supply because you can't get it anymore. After cutting all the labels out and sticking them onto the keycaps using a permanent adhesive, this was the result. Here are four tubes of relays, and uh, they're all the same kind. And here they're all plugged into their sockets. So the board is now ready to be powered up. The first test is to use the keypad and monitor program to set the program counter to all zeros uh, as shown here on the status LEDs. The program counter relays use a latching scheme which involves a capacitor and a resistor and these need to closely match the holding current ratings or specifications of the relays that are actually used so it's important to do this test first to make sure that functionality is working as designed. If that doesn't work you can't go beyond it. And then um, I'm also here setting all of the program counter bits to 1. So now the computer has a built-in demo program, which I can access just by typing in 10 and pressing Run.
and it completed. So that was successful. Let's try it again. Well, it does seem like it's working. All right, I'd like to say a few words here. Well, more than a few words, but uh, describe a little bit how the architecture of the Relay computer is set up. First, let's take a look at the instructions. The instructions are 32 bits wide from 0 up through 31. Uh, those are the names of the bits. The rightmost 8 bits is the B register. The next 8 bits is the A register. These are essentially data fields in the instruction. And then the next 4 bits are condition codes and the remaining bits are unencoded instruction. So essentially 1 bit per instruction and you can see things here like uh, if you want an AND instruction you turn that bit on if you want to rotate right you turn that bit on if you're going to do an output you turn that bit on and so on and they can be used in combinations here's how the memory is set up there are 256 words of memory each one 32 bits wide and the architecture of that is exactly like I've described here. Um, the least significant uh, 8 bits can always be treated as data. And they're the only ones that the program can write into um, for self-modifying code. There's also the 8-bit program counter, which is how we get the 256 words of memory and a carry flag and that's it. So here's a diagram of the architecture of the computer. On the left side of this bold line that's the semiconductor part of the computer and on the right hand side of the bold line is the relay part of the computer in other words the CPU. The semiconductor part consists primarily of a microcontroller that stores the memory within its internal non-volatile memory. It actually has um, sort of an EEPROM in it, uh, which can only be changed by programming it with a uh, PIC chip control, uh, programmer, which is not part of the computer, so from our perspective it's just ROM. And then there's uh, the RAM part, the non-volatile RAM part of the PIC chip, which is used, at least 256 words of it, uh, is used by the relay computer as its program memory, which is also the data memory because it's all merged. Um, this is organized from the microcontroller standpoint as being three ports, port 1, port 2, and port 3. Port 1 always outputs the instruction, 32 bits, and then depending on the instruction, port 2 outputs the A data and port 3 outputs the B data. The instructions 32 bits are broken up into the, um, the 8 bits of the B register, the 4 condition code bits, all those instruction bits that are scattered around here, and the A data, just like the B data here. Um, a data and B data, some more instruction bits. It's a little jumbled the way I'm describing it, but essentially you have a big fan out of the 32 bits that are possible to come out of memory into this structure here. And after that, it's important to note that this is a single cycle computer, which means that for each clock pulse, which is generated by the microcontroller, uh, for each clock pulse, a single relay sequence occurs in the CPU. And it's essentially kind of 
left to right as it's drawn here. So let's go through that. As the program counter that's up here, here's your 8-bit program counter, it sends its value back to the microcontroller which goes into its memory and pulls out the instruction at that address and the 32 bits of that instruction are presented to this bus. Now there are two 8-bit parts of that, the A data and the B data. And starting here, we are taking that 8 bits of A data and presenting it to this function here, which is essentially saying we have a choice of reading data from this 8 bits or from the input port, which is only 4 bits of I.O., uh, four bits of input I.O. rather. Uh, the other four bits are unused, but they're treated as the lower four bits of the 8-bit word. So you can either read from the physical inputs on the back of the board, or you can read from the A data coming in here. And that depends on this input instruction. And we see that in the, the word over here as this bit. So you get to choose what you're using for the A data and likewise the B data comes in here. It also has a two-way selector controlled by the B enable bit and that's uh, over here. It either takes the 8 bits of B data and uses it over here or it takes a value of 0. This is one way we can clear a function or just have the A data working against a value of zero, and that can be used in various ways. Now the A data comes through here and it's passed to the next, essentially a next bank of relays, and those perform a complement function. They turn the zeros to ones and the ones to zeros, and if you turn the COM bit on in the instruction, then you will get that inversion, but it's only available on the A channel. And um, here's the COM bit over here. So now we have the actual ALU or arithmetic logic unit that does the actual math. It takes the value coming in on the A channel and the value coming in on the B channel, whatever those have been selected to be as their source and whether the A channel is inverted or not. And it does two things. It does a pure math function A plus B plus the carry flag that comes in here and it also does a logic bitwise and of A and B so it treats the the two 8-bit words as logical functions bit by bit which can be added together on a bit by bit basis or it treats them as numerical values binary numerical values which can be added together. You get those two values coming out and now you've got another two-way selector and that's controlled up here by the the AND bit which is over here in the instruction. So if you put the AND bit on you're getting the um, bitwise logical AND function result passing through and if you don't have that bit on, then you get the mathematical summation of A and B plus the carry bit. And that shoots out here. And this is the next stage, and this is the rotate right function. This is essentially another bank of relays in that big array of relays. And uh, this is controlled by the rotate right instruction, which is over here. If that is not turned on, the data just passes straight through. If it is turned on, it rotates it all one position to the right. There is no rotate left, but you can accomplish that by different programming tricks. If you rotate things to the right too far, you get a carry, and that turns on the carry flag, which we already talked about. It's a separate one-bit register.
and that can be wrapped around and used in various ways. If the there's two bits, the CEN and the C invert, which are right here, these two bits in the instruction. These determine whether to use the carry flag or not in the instruction. And if it's used, should it be inverted? In other words, if it's one, invert it to a zero and vice versa. Those can obviously be used in various ways depending on which function you're implementing. And there is a little bit of a trick here if you um, are not using the carry flag, so that's turned off, but you have it turned the inversion on, you're essentially inverting a zero, so you put a one in there and it projects a one into the ALU and it gets added to the value that's coming through numerically. So that's one way of achieving an increment of the data in the ALU by using the carry flag turned off but with the inversion turned on. So that's a, a little subtlety of the architecture. So uh, then you end up over here and you've got this data coming out and um, it's projected to the output port only if the output flag in the instruction turned on and that's over here. So if that's turned on, then the output report responds to the information coming out of this uh, set of relay banks. And whether or not that's happening, it's also presented to another 2 to 1 selector, and that's controlled by the jump to subroutine bit, which is over here in the instruction. We have a choice here of taking the result and writing it back into the B data uh, memory, which, as previously mentioned, that's got to be the least significant 8 bits of the 32-bit wide memory word. And as I said before, that's the only part that we can write into as self-modifying code. So that's how that's accomplished here. But if we turn this uh, jump to subroutine bit on, then instead of using the output from all this math and logic manipulation, instead we ignore that numerical data and, and we take the incremented program counter. So whatever it is currently, plus one, that value is fed back around here and injected here to this selector. And now that incremented memory address is read back and put into memory. And this is the way that subroutines are handled. If you choose to use those functions, uh, that is a way to get uh, part of a subroutine implemented by that means. So now we also have some other stuff going on up here. We've got four bits of condition code logic. And those are these four bits up here in the instruction. Depending how those are set, we can look at this point, or this point, or this point here, which are respectively uh, the negative, because if the result of this is a certain way, then this is treated as a negative value, and you can detect that here. If you get a carry output from the ALU, that can be detected. And over here, if you have a carry flag set, that value can be taken up here to the condition test logic. So you've got these three different conditions that are generated down here, and depending on which of these bits are turned on, one of those will pass through, or none of them, and those can be used in another 2 to 1 selector where it's either selecting the B register as the source or it's selecting the incremented program counter as the source and then that's used to update the program counter. So either program counter self increments or it can be overwritten by uh, the information out here. So that's really the overall architecture um, of what's going on here in the relay computer.
One subtlety that I forgot to mention earlier, the memory port here produces the 32 bits of instruction, which we know usually includes two addresses in the A and B positions at the um, right hand side or the least significant side of the 32 bit word. But sometimes it's necessary to produce actual data. In other words, the instruction says get me the data at this memory location and stick do some operation on it and stick the result in another memory location and so the addresses of the memory locations are what appear in those two words sometimes we need to know what's actually in those memory locations and that is stored separately in the RAM so when that data needs to be presented um, it comes out of these other memory ports here and is provided and also data can go back in to there so there's a there's a bit of a subtlety there um, but suffice it to say the data gets presented as needed and it's probably a bit of an oversimplification but if you think about the relay computers having all those banks of relays which are roughly eight wide and you kind of treat each one of these things as one bank of relays you can see how the relays are organized the data passes through here and it's selected it passes through here and gets inverted it passes through here maybe a couple of banks of relays to do the math and the uh, the logical uh, anding more selection the rotate function more selection and then there's a few odds and ends relays that are sitting around which uh, handle things like the uh, the carry flag and so on. There's four relays for the output port and um, the program counter is implemented in relay logic so there's obviously a bank of relays for that. Um, so that accounts for all those relays on the board. Okay, what's on the relay computer circuit board? I've marked up the assembly diagram with some general areas of note. Let's start at the uh, lower left hand corner. Well, let's start at the upper left. This is where the 12 volt DC regulated power comes in from the Walwart style power supply. And this is 12 volts because all the relay logic is 12 volts. But then all the solid state logic is 5 volts. So down here in the lower left corner is a 5 volt switching power supply that takes the 12 volts and reduces it down to 5 volts for the uh, semiconductor logic circuits. There are two microcontrollers, this one and this one. This is the main microcontroller and its job is to act as the memory. It both has EEPROM or EEPROM and non-volatile uh, RAM memory. Uh, the user program is entered into the RAM memory and that's where it's executed from and the microcontroller manages that and presents it to the relay part of the circuit on demand so the program counter comes over and says hey we're at this program address that's presented to this main microcontroller it goes and looks in its internal RAM finds what's there and presents it back to the relay logic circuit, the CPU. This is done through some uh, serial to parallel and parallel, parallel to serial shift registers that act as IO ports essentially for the microcontroller. So here in um, yellow are serial to parallel shift registers. So the microcontroller communicates to these serially and then they convert it to uh, parallel information that's then presented directly to the uh, relay logic circuit. And the colored items, for example, the transistor arrays here in blue, there's three of them, are one form of level shifter to go between the 5 volt logic and the 12 volt 
relay logic. And then over here in the orange, these um, are quad driver level shifter chips that do a similar function. You know, there's fine details why one type of level shifter is used versus another in different parts of the circuit, but uh, suffice to say they're there to translate between the 5 volt logic signals and the 12 volt logic signals. And um, I've marked little arrows pointing in that direction for data that's going from the memory to the CPU. And this is even broken down a little bit more. This chip and this chip are involved in part with control signals. Um, so the the part of the instruction that deals with control signals is handled largely by these chips. And then the A address and the B address and the A data and the B data are handled by these chunks of uh, IC or these sections of IC logic here. Now data has to come back in in the form of writing data back into memory. Remember only 8 bits, the lowest 8 bit of each memory location can be written back into by the relay logic. And so this here is a parallel to serial shift register that takes the 8 bits of uh, data to be written and converts it back to serial which is then sent serially to the main microcontroller and on either side are some um, re uh, resistor networks that essentially affect a uh, level shifter for data coming in this direction and once again I put the arrow pointing in this direction there's a similar circuit over here and this is for the program counter so when the relay logic needs to send information relating to the program counter back to the microcontroller it does it through this parallel to serial shift register and the two associated resistor networks so that's how data gets to and from uh, there are two displays here this big display is the instruction and data readout and the smaller one down here is the address readout these two areas in green are just resistor transistor display driver circuits so all of that's in support of these two displays down here is a RS-232 protocol TTL level serial port for communicating optionally with another computer and that means that computer can be used to write programs which are then sent to the microcontroller here and you can also monitor a running program so the personal computer hooked up to this or other computer can be used to make it easier to write and manage programs and store programs um, I should go back to the memory on here there is EEPROM on here uh, and that's where the demo program is located and every time the computer is booted up the microcontroller's first task is to write um, halt instructions into every memory location in the RAM except for the part of the RAM that's used by the demo program so it essentially preloads the RAM either with an actual demo program and everything else is preloaded with uh, halt instructions and then once you start entering your own program, if you do, then you start overwriting that. It's also possible by a key combination on the keypad to tell the microcontroller to write your own program that you've entered into RAM and write it into a section of the EEPROM that's still available. Uh, it's a very limited amount, so you can't store many programs uh, in that area but you can store some in there if you want to store more programs that's when you really need the serial port here to be able to store them to another computer that has more memory the two LED banks are driven by whichever 
parts of the circuit make sense to drive them. I haven't ferreted that out yet to see exactly how they're driven, but it doesn't really matter. They're driven from the the bus essentially, and if it's coming from the IC logic, then it has an appropriate uh, dropping resistor. If it's coming from the relay logic, it's got an appropriate resistor for that. And you end up with consistent brightness on the LEDs. The way that the different functions of the relay CPU are handled in the relay logic differs depending on which function it is. So um, even though sections here that are in these trapezoidal blocks might look like they each get a bank of relays, it's not quite that simple. Um, there are various tricks that are used in here to conserve the number of relays. But I've isolated some areas. For example, this area in the green outline here, this is the set of relays that handles the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit here in the center of the picture. The upper part handles the math, the lower part handles the logic and function. These relays marked with um, a violet or a purple color have to do with the rotate right function and because all it's doing is shifting bits one bit to the right um, you don't need eight relays you can get away with four relays which I think all operate in tandem and if they're energized it shifts the eight signals remember these are double pole relays so each one can handle two signals or two bits and therefore uh, when they energize they shift one way and if they are de-energized they don't shift um, and then there's a, a fifth or an additional one down here that's somehow associated with that function up here in the red that whole chunk of relays is all associated with the program counter so it's basically doing this here it's actually storing the program counter, it's incrementing the program counter, and it's doing other management functions. These other relays that are kind of scattered around the periphery have to do with things like um, uh, a carry flag inversion, carry flag clearing, um, carry flag clock I think, the carry flag bit is handled by this relay and then a bunch of these relays have to do with the control codes uh, for example the ones associated with this logic right here the condition test logic and the control codes and I don't know if I covered it already maybe I didn't these four relays here are for the four output bits and then the other three here are also associated with that in a control function so those are all associated with real-world output to these terminals on the back in addition to the major functions that we've already covered such as the inversion the ALU the rotate right and so on there are these multiplexers such as this where you can choose between two inputs. Here's another one for the B channel. Here's one for the uh, jump to subroutine. So there are several of these multiplexers and those are um, handled by these gates here which I didn't previously mark. So these eight relays here are for the uh, eight bit a multiplexer that should be this one right here and then these four relays each one handling two bits of the 8-bit uh, word because they've got the dual uh, pole con or dual contacts on there that handles your 8-bit B multiplexer so that would be this one right here 
Uh, we've also got, um, I think there might have been a misidentification on the board. I didn't previously have this relay identified as being part of the uh, ALU, but I believe that it is. Uh, so I've marked it that way now. Uh, these four guys here are also two bits each, and those would be the 8-bit jump to, jump to subroutine multiplexer, which is this one right here. And uh, these two relays stuck in here wherever they fit comprise the 4-bit input multiplexer. Remember the input port is only 8 bits, or it's 4 bits out of 8 bits, so it's only needing 4 bits of switching. So there's two bits per relay and just the two relays. So that's the 4-bit input multiplexer. And that would be um, this one here, apparently. Although I already, already identified that one as being the, uh, the A multiplexer. So uh, technically, on here it refers to those as gates. So one of those may actually be uh, for example, uh, this one here. It just says, um, you know, a gate, but for example, in this case, there are eight relays used, and I'm calling it the A multiplexer. And in here, this case, there's four, bit, four relays used. I'm calling it the B multiplexer. So the one that I previously identified as the A multiplexer may actually be this A channel multiplexer here since there are additional signals going through it uh, it may require the full eight relays so that may be what that one is I haven't traced the circuit out in great detail so some of this is process of elimination some of its the semi cryptic silk screening on the circuit board and some of it's just raw deduction but um, I think that's a pretty good map of which relays are doing which on the board. So a couple of curiosities on this that I haven't been able to resolve. Um, I would have thought that the inversion function here would be 8 bits wide to actually do a bitwise inversion, but the only relay I can find on the board that's identified as a channel invert uh, would be this relay here which I'm identifying as the sole inversion relay. Now it may be telling that the instruction bit for that is called COM for complement. So if you treat these as a numerical value that is working with one's complement or two's complement. You know, there's different schemes for complementing a binary number. And if you assign a, a sign bit that identifies whether it's a positive or a negative number, then that steals one of the available bits from the group of, in this case, eight bits. So it'd be a, a seven bit word with uh, a complement bit. So maybe that's the way it's being handled here. I haven't studied it enough to know at this stage, but that's the only way I can see this working because this obviously can't implement an 8-bitwise inversion all by itself. There may be something sneaky going on there uh, that I'm not aware of, but um, at this point I'm going to assume that's how that works. I haven't actually used any inversion functions yet to study it. So I've kind of marked up this diagram we referenced earlier with the same colors. The other curiosity that I mentioned was I'm still not absolutely certain about how this function is being implemented and this function here. This would seem to me to be something that needs eight relays, or at the very least four relays with two bits each. Yet the one that's identified on the circuit board, there isn't an A mux, there is an A gate, there's also a B gate, 
and I thought those must be this and this for the A channel and the B channel. Um, one of them only has four relays, which I thought, okay, it's two bits handled by each relay, that's fine. But then why does the A MUX have eight relays? And I thought, well, maybe that's handling this, but again, it's a wild guess. Uh, there's also two relays handling the 4-bit input MUX, is how it's identified. Um, and the only place I could see that being done was here, so I thought, well, maybe since this is driven from the input command bit, that this would be the 4-bit MUX and the upper 8 bits would just go straight through. But maybe not. Maybe this is the 4-bit MUX and this is the 8-bit uh, gate, as it's called, or 8-bit MUX. Um, and when I say MUX, it's short for multiplexer. So I'm not really certain about that. If this is the 8-bit MUX here, then what's performing this function? I don't see any relays dedicated to that, but it may be handled as part of the ALU. Again, I haven't traced that out in that detail, but still I think this is a useful first pass overview of uh, how the relays are allocated. There's the second microcontroller here, and this is handling just the keyboard scanning and the driving and multiplexing of the displays, and that's apparently all it does. I suppose it's possible it may also be handling the RS-232 serial port. I'm not sure about which controller is handling that. Um, obviously these controllers have, most of them have UARTs built right into them, so it's a simple matter to affect um, a serial port. And there's, you know, a couple resistors hanging out here which probably have something to do with that functionality. There are also two little pin connectors here and here which I believe are there to program or otherwise do maintenance access to the two microcontrollers. So you could plug in a cable here and reprogram or check the programming or modify the programming on this controller and this pin header would be for doing the same to this microcontroller. And I don't think there are any more parts on here. Um, you know, there's a couple of miscellaneous resistor networks. Here's one stuck in amongst all the resistors. And um, somewhere down here there's another one. Uh, I forget where it is. Um, oh, down here. So two things in the middle of the res uh, relay networks, which are actually resistor networks. Um, and I think that's uh, all I'm going to say about the overview of the Relay Computer Circuit Board layout. So here's the um, instruction table for the Relay Computer. I'm just going to zoom in on it a little bit here and I'm not going to look over every instruction but I'm going to give some examples. The instructions being 32 bits wide that falls into eight digits of hexadecimal numbers. And here they're just broken in half for convenience making it easier to read. But it also helps um, understand that the left part, the left four digits, correspond to the instruction bits and the condition codes and the uh, 16 bits to the right correspond to the number to the right of the space. So you're thinking about this being really the instruction and this being data or memory or something that's the instructions acting on. If it works out where you've got a 4010 there, that's obviously a hexadecimal numerical value and if you break that out into bits, you can see that some of these bits will be turned on and some will be turned off in order to get that number. 
for example, the left digit here is a 4, and we know that means that in binary, this bit will be a 1, and the next three bits will be, you know, this would be 1, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Uh, 4 would be this bit, bit 30 being on, and the other three bits, 31, 29, and 28 turned off. 0, 1, 0, 0. That's a value of 4 in binary. So the IMM function is turned on by having this be a 4. And then the next one is 0, which means these next four bits, 27, 26, 25, and 24, none of those are turned on. The next one's a 1. So um, once again, we can see what that's doing over here. The CEN is turned on and none of the other three. And then um, the last one's a 0 here, which means that none of the condition code bits are turned on. So that's how we can interpret that. And you can actually just break this apart by analyzing it one digit at a time and comparing it to this chart. And you can see exactly how the instruction is being handled in this architecture here. What, once you know what all those instruction bits mean to the logic here, you can see how the instructions work. And you can actually figure out exactly what's going on on the computer by bringing it down that way. That ends up being a no-op, by the way, with that condition, combination of bits turned on in the instruction. Nothing happens to the data, and it just increments the uh, program counter and moves on to the next instruction. If you turn this combination of bits on, it actually tells the processor to halt. Um, this one here essentially tells it to uh, clear and uh, we have like the output here if we have this code um, it's going to take the uh, value in AA and output it so the value in memory location well this is actually um, outputting a memory location that's what this symbology means here if it's AA and that refers to register A or uh, a memory field rather and it's in brackets like this it means it's actually treating this as an address and looking at that 8-bit address and seeing what data is there and that data is sent to the output port whereas in this version of it a similar thing happens but instead of going to memory location AA and getting the data to send to the output port it's treating this as immediate data and sending the actual value that's in AA here to the output port. And this is very much like any other 8-bit microprocessor that you might have experienced in other computers. So you can decrement, you can increment, you can complement, you can do all this good stuff. Um, and it's all diagrammed out here so you can see what's happening. If that doesn't make sense, once again you can break the bit patterns apart and then look at this chart and see what's actually happening to the A and B values and what's going where. Then you've got this other part of the code here where you're doing various arithmetical functions and logical functions and here's where you can do jumps, jump to subroutine just a straightforward jump. You're basically just setting the program counter to a new value. You can jump if equal, jump if not equal. A um, bunch of jump functions here. Quite a few of them actually. And uh, that's essentially your instruction set. So it's just a matter like any microprocessor understanding this handful of instructions 
and combining them in ways to get the job done that you're trying to accomplish with the computer and then just putting those in order in a table such as this, writing them in order and program, programming them into the memory and then the computer will run it and hopefully do what you intended. Okay, I'm going to walk through the writing of a little program for the Relay computer. I got the idea for this from one of the uh, creators of this Relay computer's little demos he did online and then I uh, expanded on it to create this program. It seemed like a nice way to demonstrate the uh, computer in a less esoteric way than doing Euclid's algorithm as the demo program does. So my goal here is to take two out of the four outputs on the uh, relay computer and on the back of the computer there's four outputs 0, 1, 2, and 3 and these are logically part of a binary word, 8-bit word. They're the least significant four bits. So bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, bit 3, and then bits 4, 5, 6, and 7 are not used. So if I write uh, 8-bit data to the output port, the least significant four bits, whatever they are, zeros or ones, will turn those outputs on and off. So my goal here with this program is to, after a time delay, turn this guy on and then turn it off. And then after another time delay, but a shorter time delay, turn this one on and then turn it off and then repeat. So long delay, this one's on then off, shorter delay, this one's on then off, then back or over to a longer delay, this one, shorter delay, this one, and repeat and repeat. So it's necessary to establish a couple of temporary registers in the computer for data manipulation. And what I've done with this is recall the memory structure of this computer. I've got those 256 words of memory that I can use for my program and for data. Uh, the data has to be restricted to the least significant 8 bits. Um, and program memory starts with memory location 0 and goes up through F FX decimal which is 255 um, but since we're starting with 0, it's 256 locations. Anyway, so what I'm doing here is I'm reserving the least two significant words of memory. That's here and here. Location 0 and location 1. And I'm reserving these for data. And then I'm not using a bunch of words. And then starting with location 20, and that's not really 20 because it's hexadecimal, it's 2-0 hexadecimal. Um, I'm starting the actual program at this location and going on with 21 and so on. Um, so this will be the first uh, word of memory that's actually executed as a program. So with that in mind, I've decided I'm going to define these two registers as the counter and this one is a temporary value. So the first thing I do in the program is make sure the counter is zero. So that's this guy here. Make sure it start out, starts out with a value of zero. Then I'm going to start a timing loop. So I'm just naming this point in the program as the loop. The first thing we're going to do is increment the counter. So if it starts out with a 0, it's now going to be a 1. 
Now I want to do some manipulation on that without overriding what the counter is. So I need to make a copy of the counter to the temporary variable. So I'm going to take whatever the counter is and copy that value to this other register which I'm calling temp or temporary. The next thing I'm going to do is subtract the number 10 and this is a decimal 10. Of course um, in hexadecimal it's just A but for our purposes here it's a decimal value of 10. I'm going to subtract that from temporary. So let's say the counter was 1. I copied it to temp so temp is 1. Now I subtract 10 from it that's a negative 9. The next thing I do is I check the status flag from the arithmetic logic unit to see if the result of that subtraction resulted in a zero or not. Well, it's negative nine, so it's clearly not zero. So the instruction says if it was not zero, then do a jump and jump back to the loop, back up to here. So I'm going to increment the counter again. Now it's going to be two. Once again, I'll copy it to the temp value, subtract 10 from it. And now I'll get a negative 8, and so on. And I just keep repeating this loop. Each time the counter gets one bigger, the temp value gets one bigger. When I subtract 10 from it, the discrepancy gets smaller and smaller. And finally, after I've done it 10 times, then the result will be 0. And now it skips over this because now the result is zero, so instead of jumping back, it continues on. Now it sets the outputs to 0001 binary, and that's 0001 here, so output zero will turn on. And then immediately I set the outputs back to 0000, which turns output zero back off. Now, if this was a fast computer, that wouldn't be long enough. You'd never even notice the output turned on and turned off. But because this is a pretty slow relay computer, um, turning it on and off at that slow rate, you can see it turn on and off. So it flashes, and I don't need to do anything cute to make it seem like a longer uh, duration. So now I want to do the, the next LED. So I kind of repeat the same thing. I once again reset the counter to zero and now I start a new timing loop I'm calling it loop 2 now I could have probably written this to reuse the first loop but it's so short I'm not even bothering I'm just doing it by repeating it so I'm gonna increment the counter it's the same exact algorithm I'm gonna copy it to the temp value but now I'm gonna subtract 5 from it uh, so basically we're gonna do the loop five times before the result of the subtraction is zero. So it's going to be a shorter duration loop because instead of doing it ten times like before I'm only doing it five times. Once it's done I do the same thing except now I'm setting the bit pattern for the outputs to zero zero one zero and then back to zero 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 zero. That results in this output turning on and then off. And then finally at the end I do an unconditional jump. It's not depending on anything. It just sees this and it jumps. It's going to jump back to the beginning and start the whole thing all over again. So I've made up this programming form, the Relay Computer Programming Form, and I just did this in Excel. Um, I can have multiple pages, so there's a place to put a page number. I've actually filled this in in a uh, Comic Sans font, which looks vaguely like my writing. So this is just for demonstration purposes. Normally, I would fill these in by hand. But I've called this the Output Flasher, uses nested loops. Um, I've established address 0 as the counter and address 1, again these are all in hexadecimal, is the temporary value. Then I skip ahead to address 20 hexadecimal and I start with my program. So the first thing I want to do is clear the counter. Well the counter is in memory address 0 so what I really want to do is clear address 0. Well there is 
a clear function where is it here and it's going to take a value of 0 and stick it in the memory location specified by the lowest uh, lowest 8 bits of the instruction so the uh, code is 480000 and then BB and that's the variable part of this so BB is going to be the memory location that I'm resetting so with that in mind I fill this out with 480000 and then 00 this is the BB data here so it's going to go to the memory location 00 which is the counter and it's going to put zeros in there so that is how you clear the counter now I'm going to start here this is the beginning of the loop that we talked about here this is at address 21 hex I want to increment the counter so I'm going to look in the instruction set for an increment and there it is 48801 48801 and then the uh, numerical data part of it is the least significant 8 bits so um, that's the BB here so it's going to take memory location BB add one to it and stick the result in BB since the BB part of the instruction is 00, zero. it's re referring to memory location 00, zero, which is the counter. So all it's doing is it's taking whatever is in the counter, adding one to it, and sticking the result back in the counter, which is incrementing the counter. The next thing I want to do is copy the counter value to the temporary value so that I can do my subtraction manipulation on it without affecting the actual counter value so I need to look for that here it is 0800 0800 and then the remaining two 8-bit words are both values I can manipulate AA and BB what it's doing is it's just copying whatever is in memory location AA and putting it in location BB as specified by this diagram. So I'm going to take whatever is in memory location 00 and put it in memory location 01. And we already know that means putting whatever is in the counter and putting it into the temp register which is exactly what we want to do. Now the next thing I want to do is do a subtraction um, of that temporary value, subtract 10 from it. So that's the RSBTO and there's a couple flavors of that. One where it's uh, getting everything from memory and one where it's got a constant. And I want to have a constant here so I need the one that's got the pound sign in front of it. That means a constant instead of a memory value and that's also depicted here if it doesn't have the square brackets then it's a constant so that means I need 48 E0 and I have 48 E0 here and then the uh, 0 A is the hexadecimal constant or the uh, the number that I'm going to be subtracting and that's hexadecimal 0 A is 10 decimal which is what I wanted to subtract and then the uh, result will go into memory location uh, 0, 01. So that's how we get that. Uh, and we're not really concerned with what the value is in the temp register at this point. All we wanted to do is by subtracting 10 from it to see whether the result was um, 0 or not because we want to know if we finished the loop. So the next thing you have to do is check to see if it was zero, because if it is, that's the end of the loop. And if it isn't, then we have to do the loop again. So we're looking for a jump if not equal. Uh, 
I look in the table here and here's a jump if not equal. It's 006A and that's 006A here. And the two remaining 8-bit words, AA and BB, are both values that I can manipulate. So it's saying here, if the value in AA is not equal to zero, then take BB and stuff it in the program counter. So let's take a look at what I've got here. If the value in 0, 1 is not equal to 0, let's see, did I get that right? Yeah. If the value in 0, 1, which is the temporary value, is not equal to 0, then stuff a value of 21 hex into the program counter, which is the same thing as jumping back to this line, the beginning of the loop. So that's how we do that. It repeats those four instructions over and over and over again until finally the counter is incremented enough that subtracting a value of 10 from it will, will result in a value of 0 in the temp register which will allow you to escape the loop and then continue with the program. So the first thing it does is the output function. And where is that here? Here's the output function. Output function can take two flavors one where it's a memory, the contents of a certain memory location get sent to the output port, and the other one where a constant is sent to the output port. If it's the constant version, then the instruction is 5000, and that's what I've got here. So essentially I'm taking a value of 0, that's the last part here, I'm sorry, a value of 0, 1, and stuffing it into the output port, which sets that first bit on. Then immediately I'm following it with the same instruction, but this time I'm sending a zero to it, which turns the bit back off. So now we begin the second half the program in exactly the same way. I clear the counter, and now I start a new loop, but the instructions are exactly the same. The only difference is because I want this loop to take less time, I'm subtracting a 5, so the counter only has to count up to 5 before doing this function will result in a 0 in the temp register and thereby able to escape this timing loop. So it's half as long as the first loop was. And now I'm sending a constant of 0, 2, which is a binary 2, out to the output and that results in um, the second bit being turned on and then immediately turned back off. And then finally I need to jump back unconditionally to the beginning of the program, so I need an unconditional jump. And let's see, where is it at? Here it is. Jump. It'll take BB, that's the least significant part of the instruction, and stuff that in the program counter. So we're looking for 4018FF. 4018FF. And what's the value that's going to get stuffed into the program counter? It's a 20 hex, which is back to the beginning of the program, which is exactly what we wanted. So that is a sample of how a program can be written for the relay computer. I start with my goal, I kind of sketch it out as to what's going to happen. Then I consult my instruction chart to find what the opcodes are, and I plug those in to my chart here, my program chart. And the parts that are variable portions, either AA or BB or both, I plug those into here as well. And um, that's all there is to it. Some instructions where there's jumps involved, I have to know which address I'm jumping to because that becomes part of the instruction. For example, when I want to jump to 20, I have to have a 20 in this part of the instruction so that it will set the program counter to 20 and thus redirect the program execution to address 20. 
and the same thing happened here where I was jumping back to 21 and uh, 28 here where I'm jumping back to 28. So is that clear as mud? For some viewers probably. Other viewers it'll go zing over their heads. Um, but this is really just computer pro programming. Any kind of computer programming has most of these aspects in it. What differs is small details of architecture, sometimes big deta details of architecture, that you just have to work with enough so you can understand how it works and work with it. And then you have to get familiar with the the codes. Um, now this is fairly much a risk or reduced instruction set computer uh, architecture. So it has relatively few instructions. So it's not too hard to figure out what they are. Contrast that with some of the the bigger microprocessors that would have essentially hundreds of opcodes. And it could be really hard to keep track of all of them and really when you're working with some of those having a uh, assembler program and some software tools that help you write in a higher level language uh, and then have the machine figure out how to break it down into the opcodes for you is, is useful but for these reduced instruction set computers like this it's pretty easy to do now, on the other hand, if you compare this to some of my videos on the 1802 microprocessor, for example, the architecture there is even simpler, and uh, you can tell immediately uh, how to build an opcode by just remembering just a handful of things. So that's even more intuitive. But because there's no instruction decoding here, or encoding and decoding, Everything is as clear as day with this chart. All you have to do is say, well, I know I want to have certain things happen in here. That means I need to have certain control bits turned on. And you can see which those are and assemble the left-hand part of your instruction. That's this part here without even looking it up on the table. And then figuring out the A and the B data paths, you can figure out if there's an A and a B part of the instruction, what that would be. So you don't actually even need the chart. You can figure it all by this and by this and put it together. But of course, that takes more time and that's why these charts exist. So um, I'm going to key this in next to show how to use the keypad and the display on the Relay computer and then I'll run this program. Okay, so now it's time to enter in the program we just wrote. I'm going to turn the relay computer on. And I'm going to review my programming chart here. The first address starts at 20. So I'm going to go to the keypad and type in 20 and press address. So now it shows on the lower display that I'm at address 20 and up here is going to be the data I'm going to enter. Now because the computer automatically loads in, as previously mentioned, no ops into all the addresses, uh, it recognizes that and says, oh it's not an instruction per se, it's going to display the first four data locations. So this is the data, the 8-bit data part of the word at address 20, and this is the 8-bit data word at 21 and 22 and 23. But I'm going to start by entering my program here, which is 4800, 4800000. And then all I have to do is push the increment key, which will load the memory with what I just typed and then increment the program counter, which it did. And now it's ready for the next one, which is 4880, 4880, 0100, increment, 0800, 
0.8000001 increment 48E00 A01 increment 006A 0121 increment 5000 0100 increment 5000 increment 48000 increment 4880100 increment 0800001 increment 48E005 Zero one increment zero zero six a zero one two eight increment five zero 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 two zero zero increment five zero 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 increment and the last one is 4018FF20 increment. So now all I have to do is go back and look at the program, but I'm not going to actually proofread it at this point. If I wanted to do that, I would just re-enter address 20 and um, scroll through by pushing the uh, increment button and uh, see that all my program is entered in the way I think it should be. But I'm going to chance it that it's entered correctly in this instance. I have two 12 volt lamps wired up to outputs bit 0 and output bit 1. Uh, you can also see the LEDs here but from this perspective they're a little bit hidden so hopefully the lamps will show it better. Um, so to make this work first I want to be able to watch my uh, counter variables which are located at address 00, zero. so I'm going to put in 00, zero address which means it's now watching the data contents of 00010203 I'm interested in these two because this one's my counter and this one's my temporary value so it's now going to display that but now I enter in 20 which is the beginning of my program Okay, and run. It's going to count up to about 9 here. Um, it may actually roll over to A briefly, but around that time you'll see that red lamp come on. And then it's going to reset and count up to 5, and then the green lamp will come on, and then it will repeat. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And there's the red lamp. Now it's counting up three, four, five. The green lamp. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The red lamp. And now the green lamp, and so on. So it's executing that code properly. Anytime I want to stop the program, I just push the step, and I can actually single step through the program and watch all the status LEDs change step by step. We just saw the red light turn on and off on two consecutive steps there. Or I can push run and resume from where I left off. Now I can also change the clock speed. It's running at a fairly slow speed at this point. I can stop it and I can type in frequency, that's the frequency button here, and it'll petition me 
for a number. It's already at the default of 5. I could push any value, um, like it changed it to 1 there. That's the slowest possible speed. Or I could push, uh, you know, 5 and get it back to 5. I could go all the way up to F. Check it there, that's F. That'll run really fast. So let's resume running. Um, that may be a little too fast. Let's uh, put it back to the default frequency of 5. stop it again and I'm going to change the frequency to zero which means it now follows this trim potentiometer here so I'm going to resume running the pots already to the far left so it's the slowest possible speed but we can see it's still counting up pretty quickly you can follow it So it'll turn on the red lamp about now. There we go. Almost there. Should get the green any moment. There we go. So let's try. But that tends to really beat up the relays, so I'm not going to let it run that way for long. Resume to the normal default speed. So now I can stop my program, and um, I'm going to turn the power off. and turn it back on and now the default demo program should have been reloaded and I can test that by entering its start address of 10 and there it just finished running Euclid's algorithm again with an answer of 1, which is of course the only possible answer given those numbers in the Fibonacci sequence that were mentioned earlier in the video. So uh, what else is there? Um, as mentioned before, the increment key 
if you haven't entered something, it just steps to the next address and displays it. If you have just entered something, pushing it enters the newly entered data or instruction and then increments. Decrement is similar but going backwards. Frequency as already demonstrated allows uh, changing the clock frequency either dynamically through the pot or by keying in one of 15 uh, preset frequencies which are accessed by the numbers 1 through F. Uh, run runs the program from the address you've got or it resumes if you had put it in stop or in step mode. If you've just entered a new address before pushing run, it starts running at that location. If you haven't, then it just resumes where it left off. Address is for setting the address here to whatever you've just entered, but it doesn't necessarily program it at that location. Um, that's why I was able to run a program starting at 20 while displaying data starting at zero. So the last time I'd specified the address with the address key was when I'd put in zero, zero. So I remembered that, and then when I ran the program starting at 20, I did not push the address key again. I just went straight to run. So it did not change the display data starting at zero, zero. So that's a little trick. The deposit key is a manual way of depositing. So I could, instead of entering an opcode and then just pushing increment, which would, as already mentioned, deposit or enter the date I've just pushed and then increment, I could instead push the deposit button, which would leave it at the current address, but it would still deposit or, or load that recently entered data into memory. And then I could increment it and it would realize that I haven't entered something just now so it wouldn't enter anything new and I could do it that way. And again the step button is a way to either stop the running program or halt it but put it in step mode and then allow me to step through the instructions one clock cycle at a time and then either leave it stopped or push run to resume. So I think that's the um, the overview of this. Um, as I don't think I mentioned it clearly enough before. If the display up here has decimal points in it, that means it's showing the least significant eight bits of each memory location, which is the data location. And it's showing, for this address, it's showing it here. The decimal point divides it from the next address's contents or data. The next address is the next addresses. However, if you're displaying an opcode such as these here, then the decimal points disappear and you just get the one continuous number. And we saw that before. So uh, this, I think, completes my demonstration of the Relay computer. I've covered pretty much all of its features, and uh, we'll leave it at that. I purchased some quarter-inch thick craft plywood from the Ace Hardware and some three-quarter inch thick, several inches wide oak hardboard that I uh, cut into sections using this saw and uh, just to make it more manageable on the table saw later on, two short sections and two long sections. The table saw was used to rip these sections to the proper dimensions for the depth of the case. With the table saw blade at 45 degrees, all of the sections are given a bevel cut at each end. I test fit the section using a frame clamping strap just to make sure everything worked out at 90 degree angles as it should. With that done, I ripped each section to get the properly dimensioned front frame. And here they are sitting on top of the remaining sections. And then I cut the larger remaining sections down by ripping to get the proper dimensions for the uh, back frame or lower frame. The front frame sections need a eighth of an inch lip to hold the acrylic uh, window of the uh, shadow box and one cut has been made here using the table saw. The table saw is then used to make an opposing 90 degree cut and here I'm just lining everything up with the fence and the blade height to uh, 
get it to come out correctly. This is one of those things you want to measure two or three times before making the actual cut. And here is the result of the cut. The smaller section gets discarded. A similar set of cuts are made on the back frame sections and this is to allow the uh, backboard that will support the relay computer to fit into. Now I'm going to make a thin subframe to fit inside the front frame and I do that by first resawing one of the oak boards on my bandsaw. The subframe is going to be one quarter inch thick so I use my planer to take down both sides of the wood to get the proper thickness and also remove all the uh, roughness of the sawing that preceded this step. One of the two sections is cut short. This will be for the top and the bottom of the subframe and then each of those sections is cut in half to make the two sides or top and bottom. So now a plain oak board from Home Depot has been transformed into all these cut pieces. I use wood glue and the frame clamping strap to assemble the back frame, checking for 90 degrees at the corners. And here it is after the glue is dried and it's turned upside down. The recessed area for the quarter inch plywood back panel is clearly visible here. I take my quarter inch craft plywood and cut it down to fit into the recessed area in the back frame. There's a bit of an overlap and in a close-up it looks very large but it's only really an eighth of an inch. The four sections of the front frame are now assembled with wood glue and the frame clamping strap once again checking for nice square corners. The observant viewer will notice that I've actually got the front frame on top of the back frame for this step to assure that they're really in line with each other. Because I won't be able to plug a power cord in normally to the connector on the circuit board, I have to use an auxiliary or extension power cord routed under the circuit board and through the frame. And so I have this uh, panel mount barrel connector attached using a small piece of aluminum. And here's the assembly. With the glue on the front frame dry, Here's a good view of it and a close-up of the lip that will support the acrylic window. And here's the acrylic window I had cut at the Ace Hardware and it lays in there perfectly. Here the subframe pieces are being glued together using the same technique as before. However, these just use simple overlapping uh, corners instead of bevel cuts because they will not be seen from the front and therefore there's no necessity to put them at an angle. To give the back frame more strength I purchased these small angles at the hardware store. Here they're test fit. I'm using a uh, routing fixture on my Dremel tool with a milling bit and just sort of hog out the wood to inlay the metal corner brackets. Here it fits back in and here I've marked and drilled the holes for the screws and here is a typical corner bracket installed. Here brackets are at all four corners and flipping it over here is what the back frame looks like from the front. I wanted the frame to be hangable on the wall using either a center screw or two screws so I have three positions formed and notched to allow the screw heads to go through a hole and then slide into a slot and now I've added the mounting holes and here is the back panel screwed to the back frame. And here's what that looks like from the front. I used a Forstner bit to drill a hole for the auxiliary power connector on the bottom section of the bottom frame and here's the uh, prepared connector going in and it fits just fine. However, I realize that while the plug will plug in, it's such a deep hole that to unplug it I'll have to pull on the cord rather than the connector, so I need to make an alteration. It's a half inch hole and I can temporarily plug it with a half inch dowel rod, 
which has been cut to length and epoxied into a small temporary wooden support bracket. And that's what that looks like from outside the frame. The dowel provides a center support for two more Forstner drilling operations that progressively open up the hole. I deliberately offset the larger holes to uh, prevent the larger diameter holes from cutting into places where they shouldn't be exposed. With the glue on the subframe dried, I put it in here to test depth, and it worked out perfectly. It's right level with the back of the front frame. The subframe, of course, has the purpose of holding the acrylic window in place within the front frame. The subframe glue joints are pretty tiny, so I reinforce the corners with long, thin sheet metal screws. As with the back frame, the front frame also needs some support at the corners, but there is a narrower area to do it in, and commercial brackets from the hardware store don't fit. I used some 16th inch thick aluminum from the hardware store and uh, marked it up to make four angle brackets. And then I used my small metal shears to cut it into sections and then finish the inside cuts with my bandsaw, resulting in these four brackets. Knowing that I'm going to route the recesses for them, I round off the corners using a sander. As with the back frame, I locate and mark the locations of the brackets and then use the router to route out an inlay for them. Here they're test fit. And now I've got them drilled and countersunk. And here they're all screwed into position. I've laid the relay computer onto the plywood backboard and marked the locations of all the mounting holes plus three more that don't go into holes on the circuit board, but I think due to all the weight of the relays in that area, I want to support it a bit more. These will go to spacers that just set against the back of the board, out of sight. On a normal shadow box, the subframe would be held in place by the back panel, but here the frame is in two sections, front and back, so I make these little uh, 16th inch sheet metal brackets out of aluminum and they will go at various points around the back of the front frame screwed into position and I have inlaid notches for them and they hold the subframe in precise position. As I've done to attach covers to other uh, shadow boxes and other frames I use a pair of neodymium magnets working together to hold the front to the back. And the idea here is that the strong attraction of the neodymium magnets will hold the two pieces together, but to assure proper alignment, I have the magnets countersunk and slightly offset in depth so that one docks into the other one. A Forstner bit drills the uh, round inlay for the magnets and with two magnets stacked you can see about half of the top magnet sticks out. This means that on the front of the back frame the recesses for the magnets should only be half the depth of one magnet. I take a moment to spray the display or front side of the plywood backboard with some satin black spray paint, several coats. Now the neodymium magnets are epoxied into their recesses. On the back frame you can see the magnets stick out slightly, they protrude. And here they are on the back of the front frame. And you can see that they are somewhat recessed to accommodate and dock with the protruding magnets on the back frame. With the front and back frames ready to be attached you can see the protruding magnets here, the recessed magnets here, and then they just snap together and they remain in perfect alignment. I chose the rather rich looking Sedona red color stain and here all the uh, frame sections are stained and I have my usual heater fans going to make sure they dry properly. I'm using a clear semi-gloss polyurethane varnish and here all the pieces are given their first coats 
and I also put a coat on the back side of the plywood backboard and here the pieces have been given their second coat of varnish. Taking a break from the wood shop, I solder up the extension wiring for the extension power cord. The front part of it with the right angle was just something I bought on Amazon. To support the printed circuit board, I'm using some 3 quarter inch long 632 female-female metal spacers or standoffs, and I've cut three of them shorter by the dimension of the thickness of these felt pads. Here the spacers are screwed to the plywood backboard and the three with the felt tips can be seen clearly. And there is the printed circuit board screwed onto the spacers and you can kind of see how the felt pads push on the bottom of the circuit board. And here's an overview of the printed circuit board on the black painted plywood backboard. The power connector is screwed onto the back frame and then the backboard is screwed on finally to the back frame. And that's what the relay computer looks like inside the back frame and the power cord snaking around behind it just fits. And I think that came out looking pretty good. And now the acrylic is placed in the front frame and the subframe is put in and attached with its little brackets. And the front frame is attached magnetically to the back frame. Here's how the power cord plugs into the hidden recessed jack on the bottom. The relay computer is powered up inside the new frame. And a final test. Okay, here's how the case came out. It's on the wall of my office. I'll do the test program. Ta-da! And all I have to do to put the cover back on is just generally line this up and the magnets do the rest of the work. Just grabbing onto it and pulling a little bit and the cover comes right off. Just stick it back on there, it self aligns. And I can unplug the cord and just put it down on the floor when not in use.